The Cloverfield Paradox is the surprise third installment in the Cloverfield series and a movie premiere without precedent. It was announced live during the Super Bowl and then immediately posted to Netflix streaming service the same evening. Revolutionary stuff! What about the movie itself? <laughs> it has high production values, great lighting, sets, energetic editing, well-timed and engaging musical accompaniment, and plenty of bizarre occurrences to keep you watching. But the Cloverfield Paradox doesn't take the time to build up meaningful character relationships, explain itself, pause for proper debates or emotional reflection, or set up character arcs. The tone can get laughably weird at times with a, what the hell is happening and why should I care? Hair vibe. It's an extended Black Mirror episode without the thoughtfulness and the pathos. Most importantly, the trailer spoils the whole point of the movie. Let me stress, do not watch the trailer. This review will contain spoilers for Acts 1 and 2. A timestamp for my star rating and pros cons chart is in the description. The Cloverfield Paradox takes place in a dystopian near future in which the whole earth is suffering through an energy crisis. Rolling blackouts are sporadic and common inconveniences and countries across the globe are on the verge of warring for each other's precious resources. An international space station dubbed Cloverfield containing the Shepard Experimental Particle Accelerator is the world's last chance at discovering an endless renewable energy source. After many months of trial and error, the scientists on board finally activate the machine with unexpected, disastrous results. The Cloverfield Paradox is solely reliant on weird things happening and the viewer's subsequent befuddlement. Curiosities and mysteries abound, with any one of them being interesting enough on its own for the space crew to discuss. But these scientists, chosen by their respective nations as the final hope for the Earth, rarely debate or think. There is no interesting consideration of the ramifications of their actions. The crewmates frequently act rashly without consulting one another, causing death or injury, and then their fellow scientists just shrug it off without holding each other accountable. Well, that happened. I feel slightly conflicted. On to the next perplexing event. Everyone goes back to being agreeable until they aren't. The movie wants to be a horror sci-fi survival film in space, but its tone is too light, featuring abundant comic relief without establishing a scary atmosphere that even needs relief. There are brief sections of R-rated violence and body horror, but oftentimes I found myself inappropriately laughing. Like, what now? It's all strung together like a carnival funhouse. One room after another presents new wonders, but none of them really feel connected, besides the fact that they are in the same structure. For example, one scientist loses his arm. Though freaked out initially, he seems perfectly content with it shortly afterwards, and for the rest of the movie, performs his duties unaffected, making it seem pointless from a character perspective. The Cloverfield Paradox is all plot and no consequence or substance. It's a loosely themed, energetic roller coaster. Cool stuff happens inexplicably, and before the crew, and by the extension the audience, can process it, someone else has done something crazy. A lot of these things don't get explained. At times, it feels like there's a nefarious presence aboard the space station haunting them or something and causing all these anomalies to occur. But at other times, they try to excuse it as something else. Not to mention, the film's climax could have been completely avoided if one of these trained scientists would have just talked to each other. A reasonable solution would have taken very little time to reach. I know this because someone does reach it after the fact. These men and women of science are constantly acting on emotion and feeling. They are irrationally eager to bicker and get aggressive from the very beginning. The first scene with the crew, meant to endear us to the characters, erupts into a punch. This is a symptom of a greater problem with the Cloverfield Paradox and its writing. It loves to spoil its own outcomes. The tension between crew members should have slowly mounted and built. Their desperate situation in space, with no one able to help them, could have fueled their developing suspicions and underlying prejudices toward one another, gradually corroding their scientific, logic-based ethics with fear until they reach a breaking point. But by having these characters lash out at each other in their first scenes together, the movie gives them very little room for engaging progression throughout. Instead of displaying subtle attitudes towards one another in the rec room, the writers paint in broad strokes. 
Oh, that's the guy you need to watch out for. Those are the sensible ones. These two are a couple, I guess. Got it. To be fair to the film, there is a period of unseen time at the beginning where we skip forward multiple years and maybe all these tensions built up off screen before the scenes that we are introduced to. But... It's a bit unsatisfying. There's no gray or nuance to any of their relationships. No scenes of conversation of things that just happened. Hamilton or somebody else could have gone to check on Schmidt. Like, hey, you kind of lost your cool in the rec room back there. That's not usually like you. What's up? This mission getting to you or something? And we could have a discussion, a dialogue, something. The characters only ever really talk about plot points, never about what they are going through internally and why. If they don't care about each other, why should we care about them? All that's left is he's the hothead. He's the leader. He's untrustworthy, etc. They barely deviate. Also, with regard to the movie spoiling its own outcomes, a conspiracy theorist author on a news broadcast reveals exactly what will happen in the movie within the first 15 minutes. That is not foreshadowing. If you cut out half of that interview broadcast, maybe. Instead, the movie is spoiling itself. The audience has just been robbed of the opportunity to discover these story points with the crew. And we're now waiting for the characters to come to the same conclusion we already were presented with much earlier. For a simplistic, probably bad comparison, imagine a guy is at a fast food drive through and his girlfriend asks him through text messaging to order her what Whatever. Make it a surprise. He texts her back, sure, I'll just get you a large fry or something. She infers that something else is in store for her based off of the or something part and proceeds to perk up as her boyfriend arrives home with the mysterious contents of a greasy brown bag. The boyfriend pulls out a large fry. My friends, he slept on the couch that night. This movie says it might get me a large fry and then it gets me a large fry. I don't even think it cares or knows what it did to me. Never mind the fact that I like fries. From a storytelling perspective, what's the point? Indeed, the Cloverfield Paradox does not justify its own existence. How could it do this? With a substantial, impactful lead character arc. The original Cloverfield's plot was about a giant monster attack, but its story was about an ex-couple reconnecting. Tin Cloverfield Lane was a thriller about a young woman being held hostage in a doomsday bunker with a questionable excuse, but she was also learning how to be more proactive in her life and stand up for herself. In the Cloverfield Paradox, our main protagonist, Hamilton, has her back story treated like it's a twist. What? Yes, the audience doesn't find out the full extent of our main character's internal conflict until the end of the second act, over an hour into the movie, leaving just a couple of scenes for development and a rushed emotional payoff. It is puzzlingly contradictory. The movie spoils its own plot points and side character outcomes while holding back half of Hamilton's setup as a revelation. But if we know where the plot is going, then all there is to care about is the main character's arc. And if you don't give us a proper setup and growth for the main character's arc, then all there is to care about is the plot. We're going in circles. This is the true Cloverfield paradox. The way it treats both the main characters and the plot and side characters, each tells you that you're supposed to care about the other thing at the same time, but you can't care about the other things because they're not developed enough or well hidden enough or built up enough. So it doesn't make sense what you're supposed to be caring about. Whew. If we don't know Hamilton's backstory, how can we get invested in her point of view and recognize when she's progressing? Her backstory could have served as an interesting point of personal bias that the the crew could have used against her in certain debates and situations, or it could have affected the way she responds to her fellow scientists, besides being a bit more compassionate and empathetic. Instead, Hamilton is slightly detached and inert. Rather than weaving her development throughout the film as these events take place, it's set aside until the writers know what to do with it. By then, it's a bit too late. I haven't had the time to fully relate with her before the emotional payoff I referenced earlier. Then, there's Hamilton's boyfriend, Michael, who we cut back to many times on Earth, Michael must deal with the worldly fallout of the Shepard Particle Accelerator being activated, but in the vaguest way possible, to partially preserve a twist ending that was revealed by the news broadcast earlier in the movie and the movie's own previews. To be fair, 
There's also a clumsy arc involving Michael taking care of an abandoned little girl named Molly. I didn't understand this subplot's point until the film made it very clear at the end. It's another twist for twist's sake, once again preventing me from understanding the importance of Michael's character arc until it's already over. Perhaps the filmmakers thought this would add some sort of rewatchability for the viewers? Admittedly, Michael and the little girl Molly were in one of my favorite flatly delivered scenes. As they drive to a nearby shelter, Michael blandly proclaims, bad things are happening, but good people are going to make it better. <laughs> to which Molly responds, we're going to need a lot of good people. Oh, granted, granted, Michael's dialogue is probably meant to be intentionally simplistic in order to comfort the little girl, but the acting doesn't sell it. The girl doesn't give him a sarcastic look like, I'm not an idiot or a toddler. We're giving her response, showing that she has a bit of an attitude or something. I don't know, it's a misdirectorial opportunity. Then, Michael reveals a box of M&Ms for Molly that he had stashed in his glove box. What? Why? This was not set up. I believe I know why the writers and the filmmakers think that the M&Ms should be in his glove box, but that means the M&Ms were in there for almost three years. Surely they're stale. Plus, I was taught never to take candy from or get in a car with a stranger. Is Michael a secret pedophile? There are many contrived situations in this movie that make you wonder, why? And flat line readings that provide a chuckle. For examples, see also Michael's bland delivery of the line, I'm sick of only seeing you on a screen. Seven minutes and 55 seconds into the Netflix stream. And also the way Mundy says BS, 21 minutes and 28 seconds in. It is unfortunate that the performances are so inconsistent, sometimes quite emotional and energetic, and other times stiff and very funny because of it. The film casts familiar and reliable character actors, Daniel Bruhl, Chris O'Dowd, David Oyelowo, and Zhang Zi. For the most part, they actually give this material far more gravitas and commitment than it probably deserved. Props to these actors. The Cloverfield Paradox can also be redundant and over-explain things. The opening scene of the film has radio broadcasts provide exposition on the Earth's energy crisis. Then, in the same scene, Hamilton tells her boyfriend Michael the exact same information. Why? The radio was a natural way to communicate this information because people in cars stuck in traffic listen to the radio for updates anyway. Not only is it repetitive, but Hamilton is also giving Michael information he already knows. It's clunky. And it's not the only time that Michael has told something from Hamilton that he already knows. In fact, he even has a line of dialogue saying, I know. Rendering it even more clunky. Oh, thanks for literally telling the audience you're getting this information for no reason. Similarly, later on in the movie, one character reminds another character that he is not a bad guy. She knows this already. We know this already. This serves no logical purpose except to remind the audience of a previous beef between the two characters. Moreover, she ignores his reassurance. It's doubly pointless. Either have his words positively affect her and remind her, or cut his lines out and have her give him a mean look from behind his back. Either way, would still communicate the exact same thing without being contradictory in the outcome they desire. The film also recycles images and plot points from a bunch of movies. I'm sure they're meant to just be homages, such as Alien, Prometheus, and Alfonso Cuaron's Gravity. Maybe a bit too much from Prometheus considering how questionable the actions of these scientists are. After all of this, you may be asking, what is this movie really about? See, that's the problem. Since the film doesn't have any real character arcs to talk about, and is built completely around its mysteries and happenings, I'm not sure how much I could tell you without ruining the movie. So once again, I would encourage you to skip to the rating section if you don't want any further details. Five, four, three, two, one. The main plot involves the Cloverfield Space Station's particle accelerator creating a rift in space-time, merging two alternate dimensions. The crew is transported to another iteration of reality in which they have already failed their mission, but the merger with the parallel universe was not seamless, creating horrific anomalies on the ship. The premise overall is similar to the real-life conspiracy theory that involves the Large Hadron Collider, postulating that it caused us to merge with an alternate reality, I'm not making this up, with some people still noticing certain small differences between our current reality and our original reality. This this is dubbed the Mandela Effect, named after the surprising amount of people who swear they remember Nelson Mandela dying in the 1980s, way before his real death in 2013. The next most famous example is the Berenstein Bears actually having been called the Berenstain 
bears all along. It's a fun topic, and the Cloverfield Paradox doesn't fully broach it. The crew does not notice any subtle, creeping differences. The audience is shown a foosball table, but nobody else sees it. The majority of the changes are incredibly in-your-face and bizarre, begging the question, if the merger was that rough, wouldn't there be many more obvious problems with the ship and the crew? It doesn't make sense how certain things end up on the space station at all. Were they floating in space? Likewise, why do some objects teleport inside other areas of the ship? It is established that the crew is still on their own original spacecraft, not the one from this alternate reality. We also learned that the space station that is from reality number two was not in the same region of space as the space station teleporting from reality number one. Therefore, the contents of space station from reality number two could not have possibly directly merged or switched swapped with the contents of the space station from reality number one. This plot does not hold up under scrutiny. <laughs> Then, to top it all off, the movie ends on a pandering, predictable cliffhanger that doesn't explain anything and actually raises many more questions. This film's saving grace, if it's going to work for you, is its production value, charm, and pacing. The Cloverfield Paradox has the pedigree of a theatrical release because that was the original intent. The music soundtrack is lively and synchronized to the action nicely with well-timed bombs and tense strings that give the film some oomph. Even if you don't like the writing at all, the scoring gets you reluctantly pretty excited at times. And even when the performances and writing are awkward, there was a certain charm to it that kept it afloat. I feel like this director could do better with way better material without having to shoehorn in Cloverfield elements. All these aspects I just mentioned are admirable, but I admit to checking how much running time was left more than once because I wasn't sure where the movie wanted to go with itself until an hour in. Overall, The Cloverfield Paradox is colorful, tightly cut, and intriguing enough to hold your attention through the first sitting, particularly if you're a curious fan of the first two Cloverfield entries. But the characters have little room to grow, starting a step away from their finish lines. The main protagonist's arc gets squashed into the final third of the film, and there is amusingly bland dialogue and abrupt, contrived sequences. And the main idea for the plot is underexplored and doesn't make much sense upon reflection. As many Many people are probably saying, releasing this movie straight to Netflix was a brilliant move. I may have been very frustrated with The Cloverfield Paradox if I went out and paid to see it in a theater after months of anticipation. Instead, the film's surprise release, coupled with the comfort of lying in my own bed, gave me a positive experience. It's a movie I had no expectations for, and I got to watch it with a Netflix subscription. No big deal. Nothing to get worked up about, despite how worked up I got. However, that doesn't mean I liked it. It's quite charming in its sincerity and earnestness, despite being kind of a bad movie. I give The Cloverfield Paradox two out of five stars. It's weird. I enjoyed the experience, particularly because of the marketing, but I don't like the movie. Paradox, indeed. Oh, yellow, a lelowo, a yellow, <laughs> crap. It's pretty exciting at times, even if you're not enjoying yourself.